Hello, my name is Nick Ferenkoff, and I manage part of the photonics development team at SUNY, including the AIM Photonics MPW program. Today, I'm going to talk to you about some of our current and future capabilities around our MPW technology offerings. We currently have three different technology platforms that are available as an MPW or multi project wafer. First, the passive pick includes just silicon and silicon nitride waveguides, whereas the full active pick adds germanium and other active photonic components. Lastly, the active interposer or chip carrier is where we flip the wafer that has the photonics devices on it over and bond it to an interposer wafer. This allows us to do some heterogeneous integration of laser dye or CMOS dye and also use TSVs to be able to connect this interposer chip to a larger package. On the bottom, I've outlined some of our schedule, technology, and roadmap efforts for the next few years. We launch a full and passive pick run uh, every few months. So each year we have three full and three passive pick runs that are available to designers. About once a year, we do launch an active interposer or chip carrier run, which takes a little bit longer in the fab. Coming up in the next few years, we're going to have a number of different, more application-specific technology platforms. First up would be a silicon nitride-only or sensors platform, which should be ready later this year, followed next year by a technology that's funded by a DARPA program to create lasers on silicon. And then later next year, we plan to roll out a photonics platform that's fo focused on quantum technologies. We develop these new application-specific technologies based on market demand or requests that we get from customers. Over time, we do some targeted process development and then generate a PDK to allow customers to design into those new technologies. Our base or standard MPW consists of the full active platform. This again includes silicon and silicon nitride waveguides as well as a germanium photo detector and implanted silicon for modulators or other active devices. This technology is not specifically optimized for one certain application space. It's broadly applicable to a wide number of applications such as data centers, AR, defense applications, or life sciences. This allows for a broad array of customers or designers to be able to take advantage of this MPW and allows us to fill and run multiple MPWs throughout the year. Despite the fact that it's not tailored for any one of these specific applications, customers have been able to demonstrate on this base generic MPW platform a number of interesting applications, from chemical sensors to beam steering, transceivers, and also quantum photonics applications. This allows folks to design, develop, and prove out their concept on a low-cost MPW run before investing in some customization or potentially a private run, and hopefully, ideally, into a product that can be moved into commercialization. Our team at SUNY does have a history of doing different types of photonic custom processes, including the monolithic and heterogeneous integration of CMOS. In the heterogeneous case, we bonded a photonics wafer to a CMOS wafer to allow them to communicate with each other. And then in the monolithic case, the photonics and the CMOS were developed and fabricated on the same wafer. More recently, we've done other custom development for different customers on silicon nitride wave, waveguides on glass wafers. We've exposed waveguides for sensing or other heterogeneous integration applications, as well as a large project with UCSB to develop and integrate monolithic quantum dot lasers on our silicon photonics platform. Those custom photonics development technologies can be expensive and time consuming. However, we have developed and released what we call a bite-sized custom process where designers can request minor modifications to the MPW platform that might help them prove out their prototype in a more cost-effective way. These types of Modules that are relatively easy for engineering team to implement include things like adding extra meta levels, revealing waveguides for material integration, adjusting waveguide thicknesses, 
for adding or customizing ion implants for active silicon photonic devices. This is a relatively low cost way to add on some customization to the MPW tile that designers reserve without having to dedicate a large amount of funds to a full custom or private run. If these proof of concepts are successful, we are available to and capable of doing private or custom development, as well as integrating with CMOS, either at the wafer scale or using interposers or a packaging facility in Rochester. One of the main advantages of working with the SUNY FAB and Game Photonics MPW program is that we operate at an advanced 300 millimeter fabrication facility. We have over 130,000 square feet of class one clean room space that operate 24 seven. This is the same tool set and the same facilities that IBM recently announced fabricating a two nanometer node chip in. One of the big advantages of operating in a 300 millimeter facility is the turnaround time. We're able to get our wafers in and out of the fab for a full photonics MPW run in approximately 90 days on average. This coupled with the amount of time it takes to accept the designs, fix any issues and fabricate the masks allows us to keep the overall turnaround time low and increase the cycles of learning that our customers can implement, which helps with research and development timetables. In addition to the turnaround time, the clean room operates in a very mature industry level setting. We have tools and processes that are monitored on a regular basis by a team of engineers who review product data and use statistical process controls to make sure that all the tools and processes that we use are operating the way we expect them to. We have both inline electrical and optical testing, which allows us to test and characterize our devices before we finish creating the PIC wafer and dicing it and sending it to customers. We also have periodic defect inspections and automated inspections during the fabrication process to make sure there's no other issues or defects that arise on the wafer. If we do come up with an issue, either from a defect inspection or an inline test, we're able to either pull from backup wafers or restart wafers instead of waiting until the end of line and uh, doing a final inspection and test. This helps us reduce our overall fab time by catching any issues early on in the process flow. The other advantage of operating a 300 millimeter facility is that these cutting edge tool sets have unmatched process control both across the wafer and from wafer to wafer. Shown here are some test data from our collaborators, Analog Photonics. They measured the resonant wavelength distribution across the wafer and found that the resonant wavelength varied less than 2.2 nanometers across the wafer and also identified that the effective index of refraction changed less than 0.2 percent. In addition to across the wafer variability, we also have been monitoring wafer to wafer or run to run variability. Again, analog photonics measured PDK components across multiple runs, capturing almost two years of, of process time and found that the Responsivity of the photo detectors, for example, varied less than 3% over this time period. We see similar results from other active devices as well as our passive devices. What this means for the designer is that when they lay out their circuit, they can be reasonably confident that it's going to behave how they expect based on the models in the PDK, and that it's going to work across the wafer and it's gonna work wafer to wafer if they come back for subsequent MPW fabrication runs. Analog Photonics has been a strong partner in AIM Photonics and has developed our PDK component library since 2016. Their components are high performance, state of the art, and have been proven on silicon in run after run. Some of the summary statistics are shown here. We have both passive and active components in their library that operate both at the C and the L uh, bands, as well as the O band. We work closely with Analog Photonics to make sure that any of our process changes or process improvements in the fab um, improve or at least don't make any of these PDK devices um, work differently than the models expect. It's this tight collaboration that helps improve confidence that the circuits that are laid out with this PDK are going to work. There's a very strong model to hardware correlation 
from this component library. Starting this year in 2021, AIM Photonics has included um, multiple component libraries in our PDK. So in addition to the longstanding analog photonics AP SUNY component library that has these strong model to hardware correlations, we also have component libraries from the Research Foundation for SUNY or RFS, as well as components from Spark Photonics. Going forward, we'll be continuing to add more component libraries from different vendors and additional components from these different vendors. The idea is to give customers a variety of, of component libraries to choose from depending on um, their application needs. All of these component libraries are enabled in a multiple different design methodologies that I laid out here at the bottom. First, Synopsys allows designers to both simulate, design, layout, and check their designs with DRC. Second, we also have enabled our component libraries in ANSYS Lumerical with interoperability between both K-Layout and Cadence for the layout and the DRC parts of the design flow. These are the three methodologies that we support and all of our component libraries are supported across those methodologies. There are some other EPDA flows that are out there, which are supported uh, on demand working with those vendors. So here I just have a couple of screenshots that show the different component libraries enabled in the various software platforms that I just mentioned. So between Synopsys, Cadence, Lumerical, and K-Layout, users are able to select from the different component libraries, AP SUNY, RFS, or Spark, and then can, can choose the components from each of those component libraries that they uh, want to use. Shown here is the Synopsys tool set. You can see that the component libraries from both Spark and RFS can be instantiated in either Optim Schematic or Opto Designer and um, used for either schematic or, or layout view and simulation, and then verification with um, DRC checking. Shown here are the same component libraries implemented within Lumerical. Again, within the AIM Photonics PDK are different component library folders, and users can select the components they want, do the simulations they need, and then with interoperability, combine that with a layout into either Cadence or K-Layout and then also run DRC in either of those software tools. Also new this year, which we're just rolling out this month is a technical support or help desk site. The help desk will allow our users to get additional information that we can't always pack into the PDK. Anyone that has access to the PDK can request an account on our help desk site. We see it as an extension of the PDK. It's gonna include things like training videos, how-to tutorials, sometimes some prepackaged scripts that will help people prepare their design file for submission. And it also includes a lot of common errors that our users have run into over the years and how to solve them. Hopefully these types of articles will help designers solve the problems that they run into as they're designing their circuit. If their answer is not found in any of the knowledge base, they can always submit a help desk ticket. By filling out this form, it'll go to our staff who will make sure that the inquiry is routed to the right person, whether it's somebody on our design services team, our fab team, or our test assembly and packaging team, we'll be able to get the answers back to the customers in a reasonable amount of time. In addition, if we see that we're answering the same questions over and over again, we can turn those answers into another knowledge base, again, further cutting down the amount of time it takes for a designer to get the answers to their questions. Once you have access to the PDK and you've designed your, uh, your chip ready to be submitted into an MPW run, one of the last things that need to be done with the PDK is the design rule check. I mentioned before, DRC is enabled in a number of different software packages. SUNY, the FAB uses Cadence PVS for sign off, but decks are also supplied for use in both K-Layout and Synopsys. The idea is to catch any uh, mistakes that might've been made during the layout process and give designers a chance to correct those mistakes before submitting to the FAB. There are still some times where violations uh, occur and are picked up by DRC, but are intentional uh, by the designer for a custom component. Those types of violations need to be documented in what we call the waiver request form that the FAB team will review in what's called the waiver review board. We'll either accept or waive the violation, allowing it to proceed, or accept the violation as a risk build where the customer understands that 
while we'll allow that violation to be fabricated, we can't guarantee the performance of that, of that component. Lastly, there are certain violations that we cannot accept if they pose a risk to the wafer, the tools, or the fab overall, and those things will require to be fixed and resubmitted. So there is a multi-step process between requesting access to the PDK and getting your finished chips. I'll focus a little bit on the technical side of it. So once a customer does have access to the PDK and they they're able to design their, their chip and their circuit using the PDK with whatever component library and whatever EPDA methodology they prefer. They'll have to check those designs with DRC and either fix the errors or document those waiver requests in the waiver request form. Once SUNY approves a designer for submission, once they've cleared all that paperwork, we will send them a secure upload link where both the design and the waiver review um, packet needs to be submitted. The waiver review board then will review those waivers and the submitted GDS, either accepting it or sending back the, the feedback and uh, resubmission requirements. Once the GDS is fully accepted, either by fixing all the DRC fails or getting waivers in place, the design is considered accepted. Once all of the designs for an MPW run are accepted, we can move on to mask build and then wafer build. To talk a little bit about the documents that need to get um, lined up before uh, this technical work can begin, I'm going to hand it back over to Chandra.